Let's get all sorted. I'm James. And I'm Jeff. Today is the first part of our BrickCon 2015 interviews. We're going to talk to BrickCon director Wayne Hussey, to Alice Finch about World of Mouse Guard, and Lee Jones about Smurfs. Please be sure to visit BreakingDads.com. BreakingDads.com. BreakingDads.com for photos and more. There's a lot of photos that you got of the show for this episode. It's going to be great. Uh, also, be sure to rate us on iTunes if you've enjoyed this one. And first up, what do we have, Jeff? Uh, we're going to learn about the birth of BrickCon in my interview with Wayne Hussey. This is Jeff at BrickCon 2015, and I'm with Wayne Hussey, director of BrickCon. And so I guess the first question is, how did BrickCon start? Uh, a bunch of uh, adult builders getting together at middle meetings saying, hey, this sounds like an idea because we saw it happening on the East Coast. Said, hey, let's go do it ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the West Coast needed something because it was, it was getting expensive to travel all the time. Yeah, well, we, weren't, we weren't going to other conventions. Nope. It was more that we were aware of them and going, hey, we can have that kind of fun here without them. Mm -hmm. But I don't remember that many, many issues about travel. It right. was just the fact that we had a growing community of builders and let's, let's do our own. Okay. Uh, and uh, did it start, I imagine it was much smaller than it is today when you first started. What was that, those first years like? Well, the very first year was just an uh, exhibition and there was no, no vendors, no fees, no attendees. It was just everybody came together as a bunch of clubs and we just put on a show and people came and saw it. And it was so much fun we said, well, let's do it the next year. So we did it next year, and that time we charged a whopping two dollars, <laughs> and uh, it's grown since then. Yeah. And uh, I think you're saying you get about ten thousand visitors now. Does that sound about right? Um, that was about three years ago. Now we're up to about thirteen. Okay. We just we're growing slowly, but uh, we want a steady growth. We don't want to flat, you know, don't want to jump too big. Mm -hmm. And the, the venue here is a, a good size, but it's definitely starting to get crowded. I guess the problem is, it's uh, where's the space to go bigger from here? In the Seattle area, there is none. Mm -hmm. there, there are facilities such as the Washington State Convention Center, but they don't meet our needs the right way. And not just that they don't have, they have the space, there's no doubt about yeah. that, but they don't meet our needs. Mm -hmm. we, need, we need a family-friendly place, mm -hmm. and Seattle Center is it. Yeah, I would say. I mean, it's uh, it's really nice to see the kids here. I think that's the part that's made me happiest is just how many kids there are and how much there is for them to do. And most of the time I see them, their mouth is open <laughs> and agape looking at something amazing they didn't think possible for today. That's it. We're here for inspiration and fun. It's a great show. Uh, I don't know how much bigger they can get. Uh, there's already lineups around the block uh, on both days. Huge lineups. Yeah, it sounds like they're they're at capacity, and I get it just they're going to stay at capacity. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's tough because there's just not like a, a next size up venue. It just yeah. it gets huge after this, and then they got to start dealing with guaranteeing hotel bookings and. It seems like every convention. Things. This is convention yeah. problems. Every convention yeah. must have this issue. And I, I will say, even though the line was huge, it did move very quickly. Huh. Um. So it's worth if you're well around, go. Don't be afraid of the lines. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and if you buy your tickets online ahead of time, you don't have to wait in the lines. Excellent. You just. Got your tickets already. Good idea. Yes. Or become a member of the press as you were. Yeah, that's another. <laughs> no, don't do that. No. No. No, no, no. competition. Just, just, just listen to us. <laughs> okay, so next up, you had uh, an opportunity to talk to Alice Finch, who is famous probably to everybody from her appearance in the Lego Brickumentary, as well as if, if you've been on the internet, you've seen her amazing Hogwarts castle or her epic Rivendell. Uh, I've had non-Lego people say, hey, have you seen this Hogwarts castle? So it is definitely legendary. Let's give a listen. Uh, I'm at BrickCon in Seattle 2015, and I'm with Alice Finch, uh, who is standing in front of one of my all-time favorite displays, the Mouse Guard, the World of Mouse Guard. Is that, I think, the full title? Yeah. Uh, and that's fair, because it feels like an entire world. Uh, but why don't I have Alice explain a little bit about it? So we worked with the author and illustrator David Peterson to do this display, and we turned the map, which is in the end papers of the book, into a linear um, 
following of the story, and it begins with Barkstone, uh, which is a town in the roots of a tree, and then we go through Lockhaven, which is the capital fortress, in also sort of nestled in the roots of a, a large tree. And we go through a winter scene where we have the uh, face-off between an owl and the guards. Uh, Thistle down, and then we have Shorestone, which is a town. Um, there's only one building on the exterior because the rest of it is inside the rock. And we come down to the beach in Caligaro, and then we cross what to a mouse would be an ocean, over to Frostic, which is an outpost in the ocean of sorts, and then to Port Sumac. And Port Sumac has two levels. There's the port on the water level, which is very ramshackle because it's been made essentially from ship debris. And then we have Upper Port Sumac, which is on the cliff face, and um, there's only a couple buildings on the exterior, and the rest of it is inside the grassy hillock behind it. So that is the all 32 feet of uh, Mouse Guard. It is a very impressive 32 feet. Uh, so uh, how long did this take? How many people? And, uh, and uh, just wow. <laughs> I can't stop staring at it while you're talking. It is really impressive. So uh, We started planning in, um, let's see, March of last year, uh, because that's when David Peterson comes out to Seattle for Emerald City Comic Con, so we spoke to him there. But we didn't really start seriously planning until the winter, so December, January, February, because our end goal was to have it done for March again when he comes out for Emerald City. So the first time we displayed this was in March of this year. Um, and we do have a few new things here at Bricon that we didn't have earlier. For example, Thistledown and Frostic were not finished at that time. Um, it is about 150,000 bricks, maybe. And it was built by 20 people from the ages of 11 to 66. Wow. Uh, and uh, the, the group is Arclug, yes. which uh, I guess did it start as fans of Lego architecture? Yes. So we are almost all based here in Seattle, and we are all members of Sea Lug, which is our local lug group, and um, we decided that we wanted to have sort of a, a group focused specifically on architecture, and we run our lug quite differently than most lugs in that we focus really on sharing and what we call workshops, where we're teaching each other techniques that we know, and so it's very collaborative, very open, really supportive environment, and so we decided that since there's some really fantastic architecture in the books that David drew for Mouse Guard that we thought it was a great opportunity um, to sort of experiment with lots of different styles in the same build. Yeah, and I can say I'm, I'm a big fan of the graphic novel, and it does feel like you've really, really captured it uh, in Lego form. And there is a lot of stunning architecture, for sure. Uh, I guess uh, moving away from the group to you personally, uh, when did you get into Lego and why Lego? So I have two boys and I was spending some time, uh, particularly with my older son, as he was getting into building, I was spending a lot of time in the Lego room with him and I just decided that I didn't really want to just be the cleaner upper of everything and organize, I really wanted to build myself. So about 2011, I started building on my own. Uh, my first project was Hogwarts. And that was uh, that took a year to finish. That it was quite a lot bigger than I thought it was going to end up being. Um, and then I did Rivendell with my friend David uh, Frank, who's in the maroon over there. He actually did the Lock Haven section. Um, and then we we really just decided we were going to do a big project like this. So I haven't done an individual build this year because. Um, I've done some other smaller projects, and I did about half of this one. So starting at the snow patch over to Port Sumac, I did most of uh, most of that. So. so it seems a common theme with your builds are they get bigger than you thought they were going to be. Yes. Is that... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yes, so sometimes... Um, Sometimes in order to do it right, you have to do it bigger or better than you originally thought. Um, for this project, we did actually lay it out on big rolls of butcher paper to try and figure out, okay, we need a base plate between each of the locations for transition and uh, for the water. I did end up making the water a lot bigger than it was originally because it needed the space. It needed to feel big enough where it would look like an ocean to a mouse. Um, but there's always adjustments like that, um, especially because I don't really do a lot of pre-planning in terms of uh, digital design or 
you know, drawing things out on graph paper. I mostly am just processing it in my head, and so when you actually start using the brick, things change. Uh, yeah, and, and I think uh, if looking at your previous builds and, and your involvement in this, your, your, all your builds do have a very organic feel, uh, which I guess helps that that's the process. <laughs> Start with an idea and build away? Yes. So uh, generally what I do is I do a lot of research first, a lot of preparation with whatever material is available. In this case, we have the books that he published, which has reference material. Um, he also made available to us his models that he builds out of cardboard when he's coming up with an architectural design, which really helps. Um, but for me, it's a lot of processing and looking at materials, um, what is available on the colors that I need, and then doing some tinkering, doing studies. I'll build one model three or four different ways, figure out which way I think looks better, and then go from there. So there's a lot of experimentation in the beginning. Now, when, when you come across a situation where there's limited parts and a color you want to use, do you look at that as uh, a limitation in Lego building or do you look at it more as a challenge? It's both. Yeah. Um, sometimes the parts that I want to use just simply don't exist in the quantity that I need them. Um, and so you have to find alternatives. Uh, but one of the challenges is actually not limiting yourself. So for example, um, finding a part that you want to use but it's not in the right color so you have to there's always sort of ways to sort of spur yourself into the next step of creativity of oh this is really what I want but I can't have it so how can I get to that same end using other pieces right and then Lego releases a new set which has that part and that yeah. color and then you you curse the skies or you're happy depending on <laughs> How far along you are on the project? Right. So, for example, when I did the roofs of Rivendell, it involves a lot of cheese, and there's these beautiful patterns of the roof tiles. And at the time that we did it, they didn't make sand blue cheese, little very smallest slope. Well, now they make sand blue cheese, and that would have added one more appropriate color because there's a lot of those sand colors in it. So it, now it's sort of a drat, oh, well, but, you know, it's done, so... Uh, and, you know, I think the end result was pretty good. Uh, do you have a website or a place that people can go to look at your projects? Yes, yeah, so I have a Flickr page where I post all of my projects. Um, this last year, uh, my son and I worked on a project for the island of Burke from How to Train Your Dragon. And so that and a couple smaller builds are the most recent things on uh, my Flickr pages. Excellent. Well, we look forward to seeing it, and we look forward to seeing what you and your groups come out with next. Uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, if you see Alice at a show, she will happily talk Lego with you. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure to talk with her. And if you want to see more of her wonderful work, be sure to visit her Flickr page, which we'll link to on the site. It's, it's really nicely done. She's taken so many photos, and they yeah. are gorgeous. And you just... Yeah, I will say I, like, unrelated at at the I saw part of the mouse guard uh, display at uh, the Bellingham Lego show, which was a tiny show, huh. but and they had only probably about seven feet of the mouse guard one. Uh, <laughs> but it was hilarious because there was a, a a father and a son looking at one of the things, and the kid goes, "That's made with Lego," and the dad goes, "No, no," <laughs> because. <laughs> It really does transform the Lego. It's it amazing. It does. They, yeah. yeah, they are some of the most beautiful builds out there. Yes. Uh, and luckily, the next person I had the chalk, chance to talk to uh, was Lee Jones, who explained a Smurfy good subject for a great Lego build. I'm here at BrickCon 2015 in Seattle, and I'm standing with Lee Jones in front of uh, a pretty epic display. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about it? Absolutely. So... Um, just a, uh, back in June last year, uh, one of our lug mates came to us, Kevin Lauer. He'd been thinking about doing Smurfs for several years. Uh, couldn't figure out how to execute it in a feasible manner. Uh, he hit up several of us, Chris Phipson, <clears throat> um, Adam Reed Tucker, myself, and uh, we started working on it, figuring out ideas. Uh, we got back together in Chicago back in April. Uh, we'd already started moving forward with having the Smurfs made, and I'll get back to that in a minute. We came out with a base plan, decided that I was going to build the bases, uh, Tucker was going to do the houses, Chris do the uh, Gargamel's castle, and uh, Kevin Lauer work on trees and foliage and Azrael and Gargamel. We uh, decided earlier on that to actually do the Smurfs properly, that we were going to have to create them. 
they didn't exist, LEGO doesn't do them, we didn't want to use mega crap. So we uh, decided that uh, we'd actually have molds engraved and uh, have the heads done so we could do it right. Now as you can see, well you can't see, but <laughs> you can see that uh, they turned out really well. Uh, similar in quality uh, to LEGO. The, the form is a molded shape just like Mouse Guard from Crazy Bricks for example. Somewhere around the 11th hour, before the molds had been run and finalized, we decided to add the tail. Uh, putting the tail in the mold added $1,000 to the mold cost, but it was one of those things, well, we were already in at that point, so we might as well move forward. To get them color matched to our heads, because LEGO doesn't make this color, torso, or arm, or hand, we had to go to Kyle Peterson at uh, Brickforge. He pounded out the uh, hands, arms, torsos for us. And then uh, Lego doesn't make the short bendy legs. And we wanted short bendy legs. Uh, Brick Foundry, or sorry, Brick Fortress does those. He doesn't do them in white, but if you order 500 of them, he'll do them in white. So <laughs> he, uh, I think it turned out really well. We showed it at Brick World for this June. And uh, it uh, was certainly a hit there. We decided to push it out further, widen it by 45 inches. It's uh, current state, it's five feet by 10 feet. The, uh, and then we opened it up to the whole lug. So opened up to all the lug mates. It, I'd say a good 10 to 12 people contributed um, to sending us builds, builds from Chicago, Gargamel's Castles from Chicago, the uh, Smurf Berry Processing Plant by Mark Larson in Chicago. Stacy Sterling here in uh, Seattle uh, did the windmill. Dave Sterling, Sterling uh, has Handy's Hut under construction being worked on. Uh, Roy and Alice Cook, um, I think they're in Minnesota, I'm not sure, but they built a poop ton of the huts for us, including the observatory and the barista. <clears throat> and then on site, the Oh, sorry, and uh, Tyler Hallowell had done Gargamel, and as I mentioned earlier, Kevin did Azrael. Um, Kevin decided that we'd hand off the uh, Gargamel to another one of our lug mates, and, and he built it. Did an amazing job. So opened it up. Dave Ware did the large mosaic slash sign at the back here. But what was really nice to see with our group is that everybody came together here on site and probably put a hundred person hours into just setting this up here. Putting down the flowers, putting the water down, building all the trees because they had to be built on site. Um, placing flowers as I said, setting, rebuilding the castle unfortunately it didn't survive so well the transport from Chicago so and that that is Chris Phipson's luck over and over again is I, I think he must have said something nasty to his postal lady because <laughs> she kicks his boxes to crap <laughs> and uh, and my lovely wife uh, who is one of our lug members she doesn't generally build but she rebuilds stuff uh, Dennis Price is his little uh, magic mushroom over there for the mushroom hut so yeah. he, he made the magic mushroom one and uh, <laughs> <clears throat> Take from that what you will. <laughs> and uh, she had to rebuild that, so it was actually cool to see her build and, uh, you know, not just accessorize, which she's really good at doing and usually does do, so it all came together. Yeah, it really, it's uh, quite amazing to think that, um, you know, a, a lot of people in the LEGO world, they go, ah, I'd like to join a LUG, but there isn't a group near me. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like uh, Virtual LUG. Uh, doesn't see that as a problem and it's maybe a good model for people going forward. So how did Virtual Lug come about? So it started out uh, as online G-chat, uh, emails, back and forth. We'd get these uh, long huge emails or uh, chat strings going. Um, people like uh, uh, Dave Coletta, Tyler Hallowell, Chris Phipson really spearheaded. He was really the glue that uh, brought us together. Dave and Stacey Sterling, uh, Heather Bratton when she was around, and uh, myself, and Heath Floor, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We'd get in these long chats, just sit there for hours online, chatting about stuff, chatting about Lego, just flirting with each other type thing. I mean, you know, Lego, you do it for the girls, all three of them, right? <laughs> yeah, <yes>. so, <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> started to gel. We decided we met up in, uh, in Brick World in Chicago, got together, 
And uh, probably over the next two, three years, uh, you know, the chats sort of get hard to follow and we started to do work together, do collaboratives. And uh, it just got unwieldy, so Dave Sterling decided that he was going to start a forum for us, a private forum. Uh, got together through there, which really worked well for us because we have members Australia, New Zealand, Belgium, uh, England, Germany, Canada, U.S., and uh, I'm sure I missed a country. Or pretty well everywhere where yeah. LEGO was sold. Yeah, pretty much. And... Uh, so we all came together and uh, started working on the collaborative builds, really geared toward Chicago uh, mm -hmm. to, to win their collaborative display, their group build display thing. Take it away from the train, guys. <laughs> so, uh, and then to get in on the lug bulk thing, we decided we'll formalize as a lug. Dave Sterling spearheaded all that stuff and uh, figured out what to do to qualify. Mm -hmm. And uh, we formed our online lug. It's a private forum. It's a private lug. It's by invite only. Uh, the rules are you have to have met them twice, and two people have to have met them right. before they can be considered as a for a nominee. And then we go through, we discuss pros and cons. What do we know about them? What do we don't know about them? What do we know about their stuff? And uh, and we go from there. And being a good builder is is not necessary. You have to be a good person mm -hmm. because we're not inviting people into our lug. Yeah. We're inviting people into our family. And that's what we are. We're a family, not really a lug. Yeah. We're a lug for lug bowl. <laughs> yeah, so the, the conventions are kind of like a family reunion for you then. Every time. Yeah, yeah every time. Uh, yeah. Well, it seems like, like uh, virtual lug is a lot like Lego itself. It's a lot of different parts that come yeah. together and make something beautiful. And I like it. This is definitely something <laughs> beautiful. So Thank you. Uh, I liked seeing the images of it uh, from, from, Brick World, or from Chicago. Yep. Uh, but seeing it in person is way better. So if you're out there and you ever get a chance to uh, take a look at this in person, you'll be amazed. Is it going to continue around or is it done? I'm going to take it to Brick Can. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to punch it out 96 studs deeper. <laughs> so it's 5 foot by 10 foot now. Because this wasn't enough, right? And 96 studs wider. Uh, Put on some more stuff, you know, like construction smurf will rip up some of the pathways. Then we could have union smurf standing beside him, leaning on his uh, shovel. Uh, do some more fun things. Want to make a big pond, bigger one than the one we have now. So that's why I'll push it out this way so we can have Buddy in the boat there pulling a water skier behind him. He's yeah. trying to paddle fast enough. Do some more fun things like that. Get some more of the characters. You could see uh, like rainy smurf yeah. here. We so Roy Cook used a, a Leatherman tool and a, a paper clip and made him some glasses. So stuff like that that we want to fiddle with a bit more to get the characters in. So when the kids come around, and especially the ladies, no matter what their age, yeah. that just go gaga over this, uh, when they ask me, I can say yes instead of going, uh, yeah, he's the one with the paintbrush yeah. <laughs> type thing. So uh, No, there's... Definitely a lot of personality in this, and you can you can pick out the different Smurfs. And uh, I look forward to seeing it even bigger in uh, in Vancouver area in April. Uh, thank you very much for this interview. Thank you, sir. It was interesting to learn more about the idea of the virtual lug. I'd never even really thought about that. Yeah, it makes sense, right? Because a lot of the adult Lego community, you know, started out online in sort of the early days of the internet. Because where else do you find adults that are playing with toys? Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it's I like I like the idea that a bunch of people from very far away can break down a huge project into um, different parts and have different people build the different parts and have it all come together so seamlessly and beautifully. Totally. Well, thank you for bringing us these, these interviews. These have been great. I've really enjoyed these. Uh, and it doesn't end there. Uh, if you keep your eyes open for next week's episode, we'll have even more interviews. Uh, I had a chance to talk to uh, Steve Oakes, the micromanager. I talked to uh, Nicholas T. Ewan uh, about his uh, Lego trains. Uh, and Kevin Mitchum about GBCs, or Great Ball Contraptions. I'm looking forward to that. Until next time, I've been James. And I'm still Jeff. <laughs>